prayer we our precious Heavenly Father, we know that you are indeed mighty to save. So we ask, Lord, that as we spend time examining your word, that we would be reminded of that, that we would fix our eyes upon you and be taken by your glory. I ask that I be faithful in doing that even as we approach this text. We ask this in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was a prodigiously talented young man. At the age of five, he had already started playing the piano and the violin, and he was an accomplished musician in some senses, because at the age of five, he had written his first composition. It would become the first of over 600 compositions that he would do before the age of 35 at his untimely death. Many of his works would come to be acknowledged as the pinnacles of chorale, symphonic, chamber, piano, and operatic music. Joseph Hayden wrote of Mozart that posterity would not see such a talent for a hundred years. While he remains one of the most endearingly popular composers, classical composers, this story is not really about him. It's about one of his contemporaries a man by the name of Antonio Salieri. Salieri was a fine musician in his own right, but he knew he was not a Mozart. Rather than using his own talents to glorify God, he chose instead to envy Moses, Mozart's talents. His resentment about Mozart led him to reject God, and eventually he died a bitter old man, the self confessed patron saint of mediocrity. I share that story about Salieri because I feel that we face the same danger at times. Sometimes the challenge of ministry lies in the fact that we see so many people around us that are seemingly more gifted. Sometimes we feel frustration because we wish we could do more to glorify God. Other times we find ourselves too scared to engage in new ministry Simply for that reason, we wish we felt more adequate. And maybe, just maybe, sometimes we actually start feeling envious of other people's giftings. However, when we spend too much time looking at ourselves, we often fail to trust that God will equip His men for the ministry that He is calling them to. Moses faced a similar challenge on the brink of new ministry when he was called to lead Israel out of captivity. And thus the scriptural account of his call to ministry becomes important to us. So please turn with me to Exodus chapter 4, where we'll be reading from verses 10 through 17. This encounter serves to highlight that any wariness that we may have when facing new ministry is resolved when we fix our gaze not on the I, but on the I am. We will see in this text three reassurances to follow God into ministry. And as we're turning there, I, I want to give some background to this text. It's been some 400 years, well, longer than that, since a memorable evening. A memorable evening where God speaks to Abraham. He then puts Abraham to sleep as as he himself walks through the midst of those carcasses and pledges to keep his covenant to Abraham. And his covenant was that he would make him a great nation. He does this knowing that Abraham had no ability to contribute to that. That, ver that very evening he tells him as well that his people would then go into captivity for 400 years. And this was merciful on God's behalf because just prior to Israel's descent into Egypt, you see Judah saying of Tamar, a Canaanite daughter-in-law, that she was more righteous than he. And God was choosing to be merciful with his people by preserving him, them from the defiling influences of Canaan. So he sends them down into the land of Goshen so that they would eventually become a mighty people, ready to take the land that God was promising Abraham. 
At probably the wrong time, Moses decides to stand up and deliver his people. He strikes an Egyptian down, and he finds himself in trouble, and he scampers into the wilderness. It was not yet the time, but at exactly the right time, the cry of the people rises up before God. God hears that cry, and he's not surprised by it, because he knew exactly when that people would leave that land. But in response to that cry, he decides to call a man whom he would use to lead his people out of Israel, I mean, out of Egypt. You see, our God is a covenant, a promise-keeping God. So Moses gets called, he approaches this burning bush, and initially he pays homage, he takes off the sandals, he responds with a, here I am. But, the, but by the time we get to verse 10, we see Moses protesting three times. And each time God responds patiently with reassurances. So when Moses launches his fourth protest, it is evident that his real concern was not how it was going to be done, but the fact that he was going to be the one who would be used to do it. Read with me in verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. I think all of us can relate to how Moses felt here. However, it is important to remember that this protest was irrelevant because God had actually promised to Moses, as we see recorded in the third chapter, that he would be successful for this mission. God, first of all, promises him that the elders would listen to him, even though he felt he was ineloquent. Secondly, we see God even promise that Egypt would ultimately give Israel the provisions that they needed as they left for, he, left for Israel, the land of Canaan. The reason that this failed to be of any encouragement to Moses was that he thought he was not up to the job. It was an appropriate and humble response given the fact that there was such a magnitude to this task. So he protests, Lord, I'm slow of speech, and I know exactly how that feels. All I have to do is think about the seminary that I am at, the men that surround me, and especially our president, and I am reminded of my place in this world. <laughs> Yet I believe he has called me to ministry. So I have to be up here even today before you, even with all the concerns that that brings. And I take comfort in the fact that God shows his patience with Moses by reminding him firstly that he is creator of all and that he knows his creation perfectly. I want you to notice in verse 10 that Moses does not use the name that God had given him, Yahweh or I am the name that was memori to memorialize God's care for his people. Instead, he uses Adonai, which you can see because it does not use the uppercase for Lord there, meaning master or Lord. So while Moses acknowledges that God can send whomever he wants because he is master of all, and is able to make his servants do his bidding, he fails to see that God is more than any earthly master. God sets about changing his perspective with a series of questions in verse 11. He says, if you will look with me there, Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In effect, God was asking Moses, What kind of God do you believe me to be? God affirms to Moses that he is creator of all, without whether they have ability or whether they have disability. In that sense, he is truly different from all other masters. Because he is creator, his claim on our lives is everlasting. Never does God minimize Moses' concern about his eloquence, but he instead challenges him to act in faith trusting that his Lord was significantly different from every other earthly master. Because this master was able to grant ability or disability. 
this God is thus more than someone to respect. He is truly great. Moses should not refuse to go because of who Moses was, but because he should go because of who God was. God also reminds Moses that he knows his creation perfectly. There is good reason to believe that Moses was not as ineloquent as his protests indicated. Typically, in Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern culture, servants would respond to the bidding of their masters by an exaggerated humility, a way of showing and asking for mercy from the master when they were given a great task to do. In some senses, that may have covered any inadequacies that they would have had in, in accomplishing that task. However, reading the rest of the Exodus narrative, and even in the Pentateuchal narrative, we rarely, if ever, see Moses show any inability in either private or public speech. Only in the early stages of his interaction with Pharaoh, in fact, do we see that Moses used Aaron as a mouthpiece on his behalf. And once we get past the next two chapters, it's Moses who does all the talking. Stephen even says in Acts chapter 7 that Moses was a man not only mighty in deed, but mighty in word. But Moses wasn't ready for the task at the moment he was called. And God had already set aside a helpmate for him in this particular task before the dawn of time, and that man was Aaron. And that's where God demonstrates his patience with us. He is able to grow and shape us for the task that he would have us do. And not only that, he is able to make his power perfect in weakness, as was Paul's delight to affirm in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. God was able to perfectly see how he would use Moses to accomplish redemption, which gives us great comfort, especially for the task that we will play in God's spiritual redemption of people. I would like to remind you at this point that God knows our frame. He knows that we are dust, as the psalmist declared. God is able to see potential, much like a diamond cutter sees potential when he picks up a rock of diamond. When he picks up a rock of diamond, he has many different questions that goes through his mind. He thinks through, well, what kind of diamond should I make? How many facets should there be? Not only that, he thinks about the size of the diamonds that he could create, or he thinks about the most efficient use that might involve making many diamonds as opposed to one large diamond. All of these things go through his head as he makes that decision. But to the untrained eye, we just see a block crystal or something that might seem invaluable. You see, it takes knowledge of the art create a masterpiece. How much more so with God? Not only does he make the mute, the blind, and the deaf, but he made you. He intimately knows your capabilities because he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knew the areas that you would struggle in even before you took your first breath. He knows the things that you will go through every single day of your lives and he will use that to bring glory to his name. He knows our weaknesses, and it does not make us redundant. Instead, he takes us as jars of clay to store the most magnificent treasure, to show that the surpassing greatness belongs to him and not to us. Our temptations in these situations is, is to want the quick fix like Moses did. You see in verse 10, he says, Lord, I was not eloquent in the past, and seemingly in these 15 minutes since you've spoken to me, I'm not eloquent now. Why didn't you gift me now for this task if you really believed you were calling me to this? I feel at times that I feel that same impatience with the Lord. But God is patient in preparing us for ministry. You see, God has made you with a precision for a particular ministry according to his prerogative. 
As Reichen says, however bright or dim we may be, if we can think, we can think biblically. However strong or weak we may be, if we have a body, we can act biblically. And if we can think and act biblically, then we can live for God's glory. Secondly, we can be reassured because God is patient and anticipates our needs. Not only does God patiently prepare us for ministry, He is also able to equip us in the areas we need Him to meet our need. Read with me in verses 12 through 14. Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. He anticipates our needs by being with us at our point of need and equipping us. There is a sense in which Moses was, be, was right to be concerned about the task that God was giving him. He was being asked to proclaim the very word of God. The last thing that he probably wanted was for himself to get in the way of the message that God was giving him to speak. He could have asked himself all sorts of questions. He could have asked himself, will I say it right? Um, will my sin get in the way? But yet, as he responds by saying, I am slow of speech, God twice affirms to him, the I am will be with your mouth. It's a resounding affirmation. For a prophet who is called forth to speak God's word, there is no greater encouragement than the affirmation that God would not only teach him how to speak, but that he would tell him what to speak. Everything that Moses needed for ministry, God would equip him with. And therefore, all that was left for him to do was go. As we think of the body of Christ, it is also evident that God gives to the church men of many different capabilities. He gives some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be teachers, some to be evangelists. Where are some of those men sitting here? One can think of no better fulfillment of God's promise to be with us for the task than the indwelling Holy Spirit. He makes us ready participants in glorifying God by sanctifying us through the Word and making us into greater Christ-likeness. It is especially vital to the ministry that God is calling us to. Robert Murray McShane said, it is not so much great talents that God blesses, so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. The Holy Spirit further gifts us with spiritual gifts for the good of the body, which supernaturally enable us to do the ministry that God has called us to. He gives us kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all these things that look different to their natural counterparts. No man or woman is more ready for ministry than when they are abiding in Christ and yield us to the Spirit and available for Him to use for the glory of God. God also anticipates our needs by equipping us. Despite God's promise to be with Moses at His point of need, the real reason for Moses' protest comes up with his fifth protest. He simply does not want to go. Even though God had promised to help him with his signs, with his presence, and even with encouragement that he would be successful in that mission, Moses was simply rejecting God's call. He was in effect saying, with all due respect, sir, surely you must know someone else who's available to go. The danger that we face when we become too focused on our own inadequacy is this, that 
we could end up being disobedient. God reacts angrily to Moses' stubborn disobedience. And you get the sense that this is a fight that Moses is not going to win. You see, if God is determined to use a prophet, he will indeed do so. Jonah found that out the hard way. It is often recorded in the scriptures that happy is the man who trusts in the Lord. And if that is true for those who do not trust in him, they probably find themselves decidedly unhappy. Yet even though the Lord is angry with Moses, the concession of sending Aaron was out of his grace and not out of his anger. The Hebrew text literally reads, Even though the Lord was angry with Moses, he said, Is not Aaron your brother of the Levites? I know that he can speak well. It was no doubt a difficult task to face the hostility of Egypt and Pharaoh alone. So even in God's anger, he is able to show great mercy to Moses by providing him with Aaron. The Lord is able to equip us similarly for ministry to the way that he did Moses. Perhaps the most important way in which he equips us is through his own word and the direction that that gives us for our lives in ministry. Whereas Moses received direct revelation from God, we have God's will revealed to us in Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 confirm to us that through Scripture, the man of God is equipped for every good work. Beyond that, God is able to bring alongside us capable and gifted men and women who are able to encourage us to love and good deeds for the glory of God. Such encouragement is vital when we face conflict in the midst of ministry. So not only have we seen that God is patient with our weaknesses, and not only have we seen that, but we see that He is able to meet us at our needs, but finally, God reassures us with His presence. Even in the provision of Aaron, the responsibility for the task lay with Moses. Aaron would simply function as a spokesperson on behalf of Moses. Read with me in verses 15 and 16. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. He reminds us through his presence that he is the one at work. And he requires us to act in faith. Whatever encouragement it may have been to have his older brother beside him, Moses was still the one being called for this task. As much as God would help both Aaron and Moses in the task that he had given them, Moses was still required to convey the words which Aaron was to speak. Moses would have the very word of God imprinted on his mind, and then he would be able to speak and convey that to Aaron. But with both of that, it is clearly evident that the success of this task lay upon God alone. Neither of their abilities would ultimately determine the success of the task God was giving them. Over and over again, God is telling Moses here, this is not about you, this is about me. I will accomplish the redemption of my people. I will give you the words to speak. I will teach you. I will be with your mouth. What Moses does not yet understand is that deliverance, that the deliverance of Israel would be accomplished by God. God was fully able, able and capable of directing the means by which this would happen. He was able to use ordinary and weak means to make this happen. What Moses still needed to learn was that salvation is of the Lord. That's why God gave him the name Yahweh. He wanted him to remember that God cares for his people. We need that encouragement at times. 
when we're called to proclaim the gospel and see spiritual redemption take place, we can engage in various conversations about Paul planting and Apollos watering, but ultimately Paul himself would affirm that it's God who gives the increase. Furthermore, even if Aaron provided welcome company, there is a warning for us here. Aaron could not speak out of his own authority. And there is a sad reminder with the golden cough incident that as soon as Aaron was separated from the man that was supposed to give him the words to speak, he would need Israel's strength. So for all the accommodations God gives us to help us in ministry, we are still responsible to carry out the charge that he has given us. And like Aaron, we find ourselves dependent on another source for God's revelation, his own word. We cannot ever hope to engage in ministry unless we show our dependence upon him and his working in us until we start to seek out his will for our lives through diligent study of the word. Furthermore, since he reassures us with his presence, he also requires us to act in faith. As Moses leaves for the task, God asks him in verse 17, if you'll read with me. He says, and take in your hand this stuff with which you shall do the signs. With that stuff, Moses would turn the Nile into blood. With that stuff, he would separate the Red Sea. And with that stuff, he would see the power of God being made manifest. Yet the stuff was not a magic wand. It did not symbolize Moses' power. It did not give him any power in particular. It was ultimately God who was doing all these things. All that self was, was an instrument that Moses could pick up and demonstrate that he believed God would do the things that he had said he would do. He was called to act in faith. And the rest of redemption of Israel would happen by God's hand as he acted in faith. We find ourselves having been so well equipped for the task that is at hand for us in ministry through the seminary and through the ability it has given us to be able to handle God's word. We have in many senses beheld the glory of God as we have opened up the scriptures. It has fanned into flame the desire to proclaim his glory. All that is left to do is step out of faith. To pursue the opportunities to glorify him even when the end is not known, when the ministries are undetermined, Yes, even when our own potential is unexplored. We are simply called to take God at his word and be a faithful steward of all that he has granted us to be. There was a great reminder that I came across with reading of John Milton. John Milton was an incredibly talented poet who completed some of the greatest works that he had done when he was blind. There were times where he lamented that the one good talent that God had given him had been taken away from him and that he would not be able to give a good account before his maker. But as Milton struggled with his limitations, he came up with this answer. God did not need either man's work or his gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. If God has called us to stand and wait, let us stand and wait to the glory of his great name. Sometimes we find ourselves hoping that we were more capably gifted and that we would be able to serve the Lord more appropriately if we were gifted in better ways. Yet God simply calls us to glorify him to the extent with which he has equipped us. Jesus reminds us of this in the parable of the talents. 
that point of that story is not that the guy with one talent was supposed to produce five, but that he would be faithful with that talent. Yet he may call us to ministries that exceed our talents. And he still calls us to go. I hope that this text has reassured us of the necessity of turning our gaze from the I to the I am. Let us pray. Our Father, we are so grateful for your word and for the way that it is an encouragement to our lives to pursue Godliness. I pray that you would enable us, even in this task, to not be self-centered and not focus, but to be God-centered in everything that we do. We ask this in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, who offered up one sacrifice, once for all, in order that we may live. Amen. <clears throat>